six. Got to turn my uh, turn to six. Checked we were okay. Turn signals are on, they're functional. Oh, I was at the 26th of July. Get in the boat. One o'clock in the afternoon. Still 13 hours. And, uh, yeah, it was about 13 hours. 26th day of July, and we're heading back to my parents' house. Uh, for a Sunday dinner, not much traffic on a Sunday, which is good. Now that Lionel is part of our uh, research and the notebook's coming along pretty well, uh, I think more or less everything is done. I just have my uh, test up at the up at the uh, village of Prophet Elias in my research facility. I got to do the next uh, communications test, and that's sort of it's not a, it's not a, an exam. <coughs> it's more of a test of equipment and see uh, how things are going to end up working out. So, anyways, uh, <clears throat> the whole direction next that, that we're going into is before we deal with the nitty-gritty the nitty of, of, of the particular philosophers. <clears throat> Philosophy was always connected, always connected to uh, the Gnostic, the Gnostic understanding of things. This includes mathematics. This includes what, what we call science. In other words, it was with, with a God, and there was always spirits and so on and so forth and everything else. It is simply uh, from Voltaire on that you had not the separ separation, but you had the elimination of God from the equation. God was no longer the equation. This is where we are. This is where we're sort of sitting today. Is that God was is, is, has been removed from the equation? Okay, and we're in something known as a secular humanist society. But the problem is, when it first emerged, science was at a limited point where it couldn't imagine not knowing anything else. I mean, in other words, they say, oh, yeah, 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 we can figure all this stuff out. That, you know, the world around us really wasn't that complex. It wasn't until Clock came around and started poking his nose into what's called particle physics. He was working on, uh, and this is where the term on comes from, right? You had the term photon. Uh, and also you had the term electron. 
Oh, what was Quant doing? Quant was exploring in the regions of the ultraviolet light, in, in, in addition to uh, looking at um, how light behaves in many ways as a particle, as, as, as a transfer of energy. From point to point. So it's the particles, the subatomic particles, proton, neutron, electron, photon, that sort of were, were given these uh, sort of on ending. So these were the smallest particles. Before then, before the atom and the structure of the atom, the atomic structure of the atom. Uh, you didn't really have anything smaller than a molecule, which uh, what the virus was, it is, is a molecule. So you would apply uh, macromolecular physics to a virology. It was after Planck that you had the real development uh, of what we call atomic, uh, atomic and subatomic physics. And it's in that development of the field in which Planck is sort of given the, the sort of the moniker of, of the, the progenitor of the, the beginnings of the sort of understanding because while you could do certain things theoretically, a lot of the things had to be done experimentally because there simply wasn't the understanding, this was in an area that was so new, there really wasn't any fundamental understanding, even the mathematics didn't fundamentally work uh, with the uh, atomic and subatomic particles. But they did get their heads around it eventually, and came to the conclusion that it was impossible to split the, to split the atom, in other words, to create Create the uh, what we call the uh, the atomic bomb. However, it was a, a, an American scientist of Italian descent who kind of cracked the code. But the thing is, he wasn't a theorist. He was an experimentalist. And the difference between a theorist and an experimentalist. is that a theorist simply works with mathematics that does really very little experimentation. And at, before Planck, the experimentation was simply to prove what you know. That's what people are taught in school. People taught in school is the scientific method is the reason why you have a purpose or the hypothesis is you're trying to prove something you already know. So you're not really doing any form of exploration with your experimentation. You're simply following along. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It is, it, I got one of those the, what, the really nice springs on it. You have one? Yeah, the, the, they're nice springs. You see, look, look at the back yeah, of the seat. You see a screw? Yeah. Nice. This takes the, the, the rough ride yeah. out of the whole thing. I have one, but I don't have springs, man. The fucking one I have is like every fucking little... I know, every bump you every get. Every bump, yeah. This makes it a lot easier. It's a lot nicer, right? Much nicer. And I got my turn signals here, too. <laughs> you got turn signals? Yeah. No, I, I, everything came afterwards. I had to put everything together, and I, but all together, I maybe spent sixteen hundred dollars. Yeah, and this does uh, forty-five kilometers an hour. Forty-five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, most of the ones that, that you get from Canada are all like, like they're they, no, this is actually from right from China. Have a good day.
So where were we? Yeah. So basically, the atomic bomb wasn't predicted. And so when things went, when, when they dropped, when the United States dropped the bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that was the first indication that this thing was was real. But even the, even the research community had no clue what was going on. They had taken the assumption that it was not possible to split the atom. Because they couldn't do it mathematically. They couldn't, none, of, none of their so-called, you know, experimentation the old way, you know, the, the, the experiments that they produced, and this is and, and with purpose and stuff like that, uh, were, able to, were able to produce anything. But yet it was the experimentalists who sort of took away the purpose of the experiment and simply let the methodology determine what was going to happen next. Uh, he's the one who actually was able to get the thing to go. And uh, lo and behold, you had a form of science. Basically, the experimental form of science where there was no uh, purpose to it. It was simply experimenting. It was exploration. But this is what produced the uh, gave the uh, power to Voltaire's theories, and all of a sudden, the Marxist ideals of a ordered world based on Darwin went out the window. So now you had a postmodernist world. trying to drive a car. Look at these electric cars now for these uh, three and four year olds. And she was going away trying to figure out on the sidewalk how to, how to steer it and how to get, get it to go. <laughs> Difficult 
in the meantime, in terms of waiting to see what's happening. Um, and it's because typically the Republicans who are in place seem to have given up. They're not fighting back, they're not really representing the people as much as they're representing, representing their own self-interest. So that becomes uh, a sufficient issue. Because now the people have no representation. But the thing is that you see that people are indeed trying to get together. They're trying to sort of work their way around things. So the problem is, is that a lot of the commentators that are in the sort of public eye, who have been paid off by uh, the particular interests, uh, all they have to do is play on uh, the public's apathy, and that's it. That's all they need to do. And I said this is a particular issue when you're dealing with uh, something called the. The whole issue of postmodernism, which most people don't understand. Postmodernism is, 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 is that there is no morality, there is no right, no, there is no wrong. And anything you say or do is fine. Because I, 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 I've picked this up from some of the Gothic pages. Uh, everything's a dream, everything's an illusion, nothing is real. So in that situation, how do you fight back against a person who, this is where I dealt with it before, you know, a person who the entire argument is, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. Well, it's all good. At what point in time does something become bad? And they typically have no answer for it. And ironically enough, the person I know who was like that, yet when it, this was earlier on, became a politician and this person was as generic as possibly he could be he stood for absolutely nothing so when you go to you know how do you deal with people like this in a government situation who, who don't believe in anything because you could th they'll agree with you they'll, oh, oh yeah, yes, yes 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 but when it comes down to the details They'll screw around so much that even when you think you've got something good, you've got something bad. I mean, at this point in time, as is before, I say, well, elect, elect anyone but a Democrat. Well, no, that's no longer true. That was my whole argument. The whole argument for the GOP was that at least they're better than, they're, they're, they're better than, the, the, than the Democrats. That's the only reason why you would vote for them. But not anymore. The, the GOP now is as bad as uh, the Democrats are. And so that line goes over the window. So it becomes, well, well, if that's the case, well, who do you vote for now? And the, my answer is, I don't know. I don't know if the vote even actually matters. But if both sides of the game have given up, they're on the same side, then it doesn't matter who wins, the uh, interests that be, the, the, the elite, always win. The key is, is that you've got to be sufficiently independent or self-sufficient in order to survive. And that takes an entirely different approach to things. And I think the next step would be, from my perspective, is the most damage that can be done is through the police. And the police are controlled by the mayors. So your next point of attack wouldn't be the presidential or the state. It would be the mayors. It would be your local government, municipal governments. Because they're the ones who control the police. And you have to get the police out, do the message to the police, who are you going to support? Are you going to support the government and their decisions, or are you going to support the people? Because you can't do both. And there have to be enough people 
of the police department who are willing to step back and say we're not going to participate in the government uh, sort of enforcement. The question is how many other people will step in and do the same thing? Or how many people will step in and be part of the government? And this is where it comes down to an issue of gnosis and sort of a spirituality. But where is your morality? And because gnosis actually defines your morality. If you are what we call agnostic, without knowledge of the beyond, and this is a, your spiritual existence, then you're also without morality. There is no fundamental, fundamental morality. And this was the argument of Voltaire in hedonism, is that there is no fundamental morality. It was Anna Freud who stated in order for man not to be a wild beast, that an order in the structure was necessary. And this is how they termed, they, they, they sort of came up with the term normal. This was done by FDR and Anna Freud. Uh, and this was in the 1930s. And it's Anna Freud and FDR who, who basically created the American dream. The American dream was the standard that would, by which the Americans would live and be successful because they wouldn't be wild animals. It would separate them from the, from the savages. However, in the 60s, all this came to the end, to an end. When it became about the postmodern philosophy, it became about sort of anything goes. It became well, there are no rules because the science says there is no rules. There is because the world and, and the in the universe is nothing more than an illusion. It's a hologram. So if you have you have an illusion and a hologram, a dream, uh, then uh, what's the point in morality? And this is where everything kind of fell apart. And we've been evolving from this perspective of Timothy O'Leary and Ram Dass since then. However, the dream is kind of short-lived, that their dream is kind of short-lived, because they start off as nihilistic, as being nihilistic, as being, you know, well, okay, life's a party and everyone's enjoying themselves. The problem is the drug addiction and the alcohol abuse get to a point where they start to effectively become addicts. In the addiction, they become violent. The addiction makes them violent. And they move from the nihilist, the nihilist position to the anarchist position, to where they're now actively destroying society, destroying their environment. So they go from the environmentalist who wants to preserve everything, and sort of lovey-dovey, to the warrior, to the basically destruction. They become the destroyer, not the creator or the preserver. And at that point, this is where things become what we call tribalism, or in the case, neo-tribalism. 